Ted Lasso is one of my favorite shows, and if you haven't seen it, you're missing out, but aside from its innate greatness, every time they show announcers during the matches, I notice they're using these super weird looking microphones. I figured this had to be more than just a strange prop for a TV show, so I decided to investigate a little bit and figure out what the heck these mics are. Turns out that the reason the announcers in Ted Lasso were using these mics is because the show wants to be accurate. These are incredibly common microphones for sports announcers, not just now, but since the 1950s. The brand that makes them is called Kohl's, and there are a few different models of them, but for the most part, they're called lip microphones because you can press that up against your lip while you're talking. And I would like to pay a little bit of lip service to B&H Photo who let me borrow this for a month, although I think I've had it for two. We won't talk about that, but thank you BNH for letting me borrow this microphone so I can explore it to make this video, and then I'll be sending it back to you soon, I promise. The whole purpose of this microphone with this weird design is to isolate the speaker's voice in a really loud environment, like a sporting event, although Coles also says that it can be used in extreme weather like wind up to 40 miles per hour. I did as much of a wind test as I could put together, but it's definitely not 40 mile per hour conditions, thankfully, because I wouldn't have wanted to do that. So now for this super scientific test, I'm outside in the wind because it's, I got wind that it was going to be windy today. And right now I'm using the Shure SM57 with a little windscreen on it. So this is a pretty standard like holding and talking microphone. There are bigger windscreens that you can buy for this, but we're trying to see what works out of the box. So again, uh, in the wind, this is the Shure SM57. And now this is the Coles microphone in the same situation. And this is what that sounds like. So we're trying to listen not only for audio quality, but also any reduction in wind noise or wind sounds. I'll try to wait for a big gust of wind to come by. Filled with gusto, gusto with gusto. So here's a pretty big gust now that's happening and this is me talking into the Coles microphone with the wind, I'm sort of turning into the wind, away from the wind. And here's me talking into the Shure SM57, into the wind, away from the wind, basically the same scenarios. Shure SM57, there's also a plane flying overhead and the Coles can't remember the exact name of it. Same thing in the same situation, very scientific. Let me be clear that you probably don't need this microphone. I am not trying to sell you on this microphone. This is a very specialized, very specific, and pretty expensive piece of equipment that most of us probably don't need. And if you do need it, you probably know that you need it and you probably already have it. I just think it's really neat and it's so different from anything else that I've used that I just wanted to take a closer look and see what it's all about. Obviously, the first thing that stands out is the design. This is a very strange looking microphone. If I go over here to my Sony Handycam, because it's, it's the handy, anyway. It's a handheld microphone, but it's all of these wind screens and pop filters that really kind of give it this cool look, and I like it. It almost looks like some crazy like steampunk piece of audio gear. It is made out of rubber and it's really grippy to the point where it's almost unpleasant to touch. It kind of has that like melted sticky rubber feel, but that's on purpose, which makes sense so that when you're holding it in a loud, crowded, or crazy weather condition, the microphone, even if you're using gloves or something, is not going to easily slip out of your hand. We've got multiple pop filters and windscreens, and of course this lip bar, which goes right up against your mouth to position the microphone properly, and it is just an XLR microphone. I do feel weird for whoever ends up actually buying this microphone after I return it, knowing that I've had to use it up against, it's weird. Maybe it makes it more valuable, but probably less. But on top of this weird design, which is rooted just in practicality, obviously the sound quality is really important because this is intended to be a broadcast microphone. So let's switch over to it now. This is a ribbon microphone. So unlike a dynamic mic or unlike a condenser microphone, this is a ribbon microphone. So I'm going to connect it via XLR to the Rodecaster Pro, but I am not running phantom power to the microphone. I'll be running it through a FET head. We'll kind of get to this in a second. So up until now, you've been listening to me on the Sennheiser MKH-50, which is boomed out of frame as usual. And now you're listening to me on the Coles microphone running through the Rodecaster Pro 2. And there are no effects and no processing. So this is just, I'm trying to really nail those plosives as plosively as I possibly can. And you can see the microphone is very, very close 
to my mouth right now. And this is what that sounds like. I, I don't have any processing, but I do, like I said, have phantom power turned on. And I guess for most of this video, you're just gonna not see the bottom half of my face. And the thing that really made this stand out to me in Ted Lasso was the sound quality, because I think that this is a really good sounding microphone. And I kind of assumed that maybe they were doing movie magic and the announcers were using these microphones that weren't really plugged in and they were kind of overdubbing stuff. And maybe they did, but that also didn't really make sense. It kind of makes sense for them to just use the actual broadcast microphones that an announcer would be using during a sports event. And the sound quality is not just important because obviously you want a microphone to have good sound quality, but if you think of the type of events that these are going to be used at, they're long. They're a couple of hours or more at a time, and if the microphone sounds unpleasant or starts to get fatiguing, then that's going to be not great for the audience, for the viewers and the listeners to that broadcast because they're going to get tired of listening to the person's voice through that microphone. Now, of course, you can add a little bit of EQ, and in fact, even right here, I will add a little bit of EQ so that way you can hear not just the raw sound like before, but what it sounds like after I've sort of tried to make it sound as good as possible on my voice. And this is probably something that would be done in a broadcast setting. It would be running through some kind of signal chain, some kind of processing that would allow it to then sound its absolute best with the specific voice that's being used. And in fact, I think I'll just actually keep this process sound just because it does sound pleasant. And even though it's not the default sound of the microphone out of the box, it gives you an idea of how it can sound once you dial it in specifically. Now, as I mentioned, this is a ribbon microphone. It's the first time I've ever used a ribbon microphone, and I I think I deserve a blue ribbon because I haven't broken it. And ribbon mics are a little more delicate than typical dynamic and condenser microphones because the way that they work is there is essentially a small piece of metal that is very thin, a metal ribbon, and that is between two magnets, and that's sort of how the sound through magic somehow is being produced and captured. From what I understand, it works in a very similar way to how your eardrum works, which then, according to Coles especially, means that the microphone reproduces a very accurate sound or a sound similar to what you would hear with your ears if you're there because it's, it's capturing sound through the same type of mechanic as your biological ears would. But that very thin metal ribbon is also very, very delicate. And so traditionally with something like a dynamic microphone, like if I take my SM7B back there and I run it through the Rodecaster and I have phantom power turned on, I'm really not going to hurt the microphone. With a ribbon microphone, if I connected it and just ran phantom power, there is a very, very real chance of me just destroying the microphone and breaking it which b &H would not like, and then I would have to buy this microphone. So it's very important anytime you're using not just this, but any ribbon mic, not to run phantom power directly into the microphone. But at the same time, you might find that you're not getting a loud enough signal just directly from the microphone. So you can use a booster. Like right now, I am running it through the Fethead in the Rodecaster Pro 2, and the Fethead, the booster, does take phantom power to work. So you can run phantom power into your booster, but then the power stops there, because the booster boosts the signal, and then there's no power going out to the microphone itself. It's just the signal being captured. So you can use a booster that takes phantom power. You just want to make sure that you don't run phantom power directly into your ribbon mic. This was everything I had to learn about ribbon microphones when I wanted to check out this microphone. If the Dark Knight ever used this microphone, it would be Batman and Ribbon. The reason I'm interested in this is not just because it looks so different from everything else that I've seen, but also because I love things that are that are kind of like hyper-specialized. Most people, like I said, don't need this. You don't need this for your podcast or your live stream. In fact, it would be uncomfortable. I got a sweaty upper lip over here. Is that why Brits have stiff upper lips? Is it because of these microphones? But it's fascinating to me that this specific design came out of necessity. You needed to block out weather, you needed to block out crowd noise, you needed something that a person could easily hold. You also don't want them to think about, if you've ever seen people with handheld microphones, they get excited and they move them different distances from their mouth and it changes the sound level and the sound quality. This one has a specific piece, so you just place that literally on your body and then it keeps it positioned perfectly and then you get great quality without having to really think about anything you just as long as the microphone's right here it's going to sound good and 
in the case of announcers, if there's someone else right next to you using a microphone, you're not going to get any cross audio. You're not going to get any mic bleed or phasing issues between these two microphones. They're going to be totally isolated between them. So the next time you see one of these microphones, either in an episode of Ted Lasso or in the real world in an actual broadcast, just know that what you're looking at is a legacy that was developed decades ago and still works incredibly well to this day. And speaking of things that work incredibly well, thank you to everyone who helps support my channel through Patreon and YouTube channel memberships. This, again, just absolutely like the Grinch makes my heart grow three sizes too big, and I should probably see a doctor about it, but thank you very much. 